in the beginning of an experience, when the paralysis is happening, imagine electrical current. There's a lot I don't know, but I do know that they're here. What we're experiencing is contact with actual intelligent beings. That's when I knew for certain that the kids were being abducted as well. And I thought the aliens would attack me. Would attack you and do what? Hurt you? Yes. How would they do that? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. I speak for all of my family in appreciating the, the effort you've made to come and touch us, to be with us, to, uh, to share with us in appreciation of my dad, my father, John Mack. You're his friends. His John Mack was a distinguished psychiatric doctor and one of the most respected professors at Harvard University. John Mack died in a car accident in September 2004. Today, the scientific community at Harvard, and also his colleagues, family, and friends, are bidding him a last farewell and a solemn tribute. John Mack treated some of the many people around the world who claim to have been abducted by extraterrestrials. After working for years with several hundred of them, he caused an uproar when he revealed that these people were not crazy, but were telling the truth. in the most fundamental and most spiritual sense, there was only one Today I'm in Boston. I met John the year before he died. It was then that we started working on this film. Several people here, like Randy, have become friends over the last year. Randy is an abductee, one of the people who have experienced encounters with other beings, experiencer, as John used to call them. Rudy Shield is also here. Rudy's a renowned scientist in the U.S. and an astrophysicist at the Harvard Center for Astrophysics. He and John were close friends. The person is uh, in the car or sleeping, and then there's, entered, there's a light. These entities come into the room. They feel themselves paralyzed. They're moved. They're taken. They go into a ship. Something happens there. There may be other people there. They have uh, telepathic communication with the aliens. There's some probing. There's a whole complicated set of events that takes place, which is consistent from one person to another. But there's a basic story here that after several hundred cases in this country and in many other countries, it all begins to hold together as, as something that has a, a very robust kind of um, truth uh, to it. And, and uh, if this is real, then what does that mean? I'm Stefan Alex, an investigative journalist, formerly a war correspondent. With this professional background, I began this investigation two years ago into the manifestation of life in the universe. While I didn't have any preconceived ideas on the subject, tales of UFOs seemed somewhat far-fetched to me. I was intrigued, however, on discovering that serious scientists were devoting a great deal of time to conducting research on the subject. After several months, I was compelled to face the facts. No, we can't explain it all, far from it even. And Rudy Shield wouldn't be one to disagree. He's just published the fruits of his years of astrophysics research, which should earn him international renown. According to this tireless research, a current scientific certainties are proving to be increasingly fragile. The astronomical view today is that probably any star in the sky that you would look at probably has one habitable planet. And so it almost takes a great act of religious fervor to believe that life did not start somewhere else in the universe. I would say that when I listen 
to these experiencers and their stories, I find that in them an incredible coherence. In other words, if they were trying to just make up some story, I don't think that they could make up 15 or 20 facts that all are compatible and self-consistent in a picture of a distant civilization. In this way, I could persuade myself the way John Mack has persuaded himself that these people are not making these stories up. The alien abduction phenomena has been subject of research in America for over 30 years. I went down to New York to find the first man to spur interest in this field. John introduced me to him last year. Uh, this woman, Blanche, was a psychologist, and she asked me, did I want to meet uh, Bud Hopkins? And I said, who's he? She said, well, he's uh, an artist in New York who uh, works with people who uh, have had the experience of being uh, taken by aliens into spaceships. And I thought this was absolutely crazy. This was too far out for me. She said, no, it's very real. You should go meet him. So I went to see him. There were several of the people were there. Uh, and I, uh, I was struck by the fact that they were very uh, regular people, ordinary people, except that they had had extraordinary experiences, you know. And um, that was mind-blowing for me. Bud Hopkins lives in downtown Manhattan. He first heard about the phenomenon of extraterrestrial abduction in 1975. He's the one who first published books on alien abduction. Since then, he's analyzed hundreds of new cases. I asked Randy if he wanted to meet us at Bud's house. He knew Bud well. Randy was one of John's patients. He claims to have had extraterrestrial encounters since childhood, encounters which have left him profoundly traumatized. It was this trauma, similar to that suffered by a number of war veterans, that convinced John that something very real was going on and that these abductions could not have been simply invented. A light totally filled the room, like everywhere. It seemed like it was coming from everywhere. I couldn't move. And uh, I saw these four beings, creatures, whatever you want to call them. Basically, I like there's something different, other species other than us. Um, came into the room. I don't know how they got in the house. I mean, it seemed like they came right through um, the wall, believe it or not. And um, I could see them all down the side of my bed. And I was four. One was right close to my face, probably a foot and a half away. And... Uh, I couldn't move, and then I was freaking out. I mean, so when I turned to f face them, I was just gonna fight, you know? I was gonna defend myself. And I couldn't move until that point, you know? I was frozen with fear. And um, when I turned to face them, that's when the one closest to me had this rod-like device started coming toward me as I was turning to face them toward this way. And his arm was coming toward my neck. And as I could see it coming toward me, and it was coming fast. And it's, oh, it was almost like time slowed down in that second to, because uh, my whole life just because I thought I was going to die. I thought that was whatever that was coming toward me was going to kill me. And um, my whole life flashed before my eyes. And then, uh, then it hit my neck. And then I just lost my, my, uh, my whole body froze. Or just, I couldn't feel it anymore. And I felt, it made a sound. It was electrical, some kind of, some kind of electrical, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't know how you, it's like an electrical, um, buzzing sound. And, uh, and then it, it seemed like it shut my body down systematically, my physical body, and then my mind, and then my, like systems, system by system, 
felt like it shut my whole body down. Um, but every time I go to what ha remembering what happened, it's there. It's there. I mean, and I can't. I just know it right here in my gut that um, what happened was real.